Hello. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for being with us today, both the people in the room and on a virtual basis, to discuss on climate action and the new urban agenda, SDG localization and sustainable urban policy for resilience. A warm welcome as well to our panelists today. My name is Diego, Diego Aulestia. I am the head of the Human Settlement Unit of the Economic Commission of Latin America and the Caribbean. And I will be moderating this exchange. Cities are key to the fulfillment of SDGs and the new urban agenda. Progress towards the fulfillment of the 2030 agenda must involve addressing the threefold urban deficits, social, economic, and environmental. On one hand, cities are vital to national productivity, but they are also suffering the effects of economic recession, post-pandemic adjustment, and the industrialization processes. On the other hand, the goals of the Paris Agreement requires a structural changes in the development patterns and the decarbonization of urban activities. Transformative recovery means a shift in the way that cities produce, grow, move, and are planned and managed. It is necessary to change the urban development patterns and look at our cities as a source of social and environmental opportunities and spurs for the realization of social and economic rights as living entities that contribute to the fight against climate change. The orientation of this event is close to projects that the regional commissions, along with UN Habitat and UNCDF, have worked as one. The project on building urban economic resilience during and after COVID-19 focus on strengthening the capacities of local governments in 16 cities globally to design, implement, and monitor sustainable, resilient, and inclusive COVID-19 economic and financial responses. Let's see a short video on the scope and activities of this project. The United Nations Secretary General has called for a sustainable and inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The UN Socioeconomic Framework for Immediate COVID-19 Response emphasizes the need to empower local governments, scale community, and city-level resilience. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the vulnerability of cities, which have become hotspots for the transmission of the virus, but are also amongst the main actors to react to the emergency. The UNDA Rapid Response Project, titled Building Urban Economic Resilience During and After COVID-19, focuses on strengthening the capacities of local governments in 16 cities around the world. This project is a partnership between the five regional commissions of Europe, Africa, Western Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Asia and the Pacific, as well as UN Capital Development Fund and UN Habitat. The project is working to design, implement, and monitor sustainable, resilient, and inclusive COVID-19 socioeconomic and financial responses, recovery, and rebuilding plans. UNDA Rapid Response promotes the principle of recovering better by supporting circularity and decarbonization in cities while focusing on overcoming inequalities to aid the most vulnerable in society. The project will contribute to planning for more resilient cities and supporting local government efforts to withstand shocks like the COVID-19 pandemic or other urban system stresses likely to occur in a predominantly urban world. UNDA Rapid Response pursues the following five interrelated dimensions of economic and financial resilience of cities, labor market conditions, economic governance, business environment, financial arrangements and infrastructure and connectivity, with an explicit focus on leveraging digital and technology-based solutions and opportunities within the green economy. Project outcomes will be integrated with and contribute to national and global resilience building efforts. Join us in the efforts to recover better. The progressive potential of urbanization can be lost in the absence of socially inclusive urban plans and policy decisions 
that foster well-being and leave no one and no place behind. The extent to which the urban potential can be harnessed relies strongly on the capacity of national and local governments to develop strategies that include cross-sectoral, multi-stakeholder integration, and operate on multiple levels and scales of intervention. Through the project Interregional Cooperation for the Implementation of the New Urban Agenda, the UN regional commissions and UN Habitat will increase policy coherence amongst member states and promote improved capacities of institutions and other agents of change in the implementation and monitoring of the 2030 Agenda and the new Urban Agenda. This requires a greater integration of regional, national, and local dimensions through a variety of activities, including building capacity of national and local level decision makers to develop cross-sectoral and integrated urban action plans to establish mechanisms for sharing of information and successful practices combining global relevance with regional pertinency. And third, facilitating an inclusive process of regional monitoring and reporting on sustainable urbanization frameworks. In today's panel, we will be reflecting about these important issues. The organization of the panel is as follows. We will watch now an opening message from the Deputy Secretary of Economic Commission for Europe, and then we will have an intervention by UN Habitat. After those reflections, we will have remarks from local and national authorities from the five regions on climate action and new urban agenda, particularly on localization and sustainable urban policies for resilience. Dear UN colleagues, representatives of the national and local governments, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of UNIC at this one UN event at the UNFCCC COP27 on climate action and new urban agenda, sustainable development goals, localization, and sustainable urban policy for resilience. I would like to thank our colleagues at ECLAC for leading and organizing this one UN event, which is taking place in person in Sharm el Sheikh. And I'm sorry that, that I could not be there with you. Cities are responsible for a significant part of the greenhouse gas emissions, both directly as generators of such emissions and indirectly as end users of fossil fuel based energies and other goods and services the production of which generates emissions elsewhere. Cities should therefore be considered as strategic vehicles for climate change mitigation. But it is also clear that urban communities are themselves vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Urban areas concentrating people and infrastructure often in hazard prone locations experience some of the largest impacts from both gradual climate changes and abrupt natural occurrences that are often climate induced. And it is often the poorer and the more disadvantaged people who suffer the most. Cities should also therefore embrace socially oriented policies for climate change adaptation. Mitigation and adaptation are two sides of an urban strategy for climate neutrality. In addressing climate change consequences uh, through climate adaptation and mitigation, city governments need to address multiple disasters simultaneously. They need to have capacities to deal with complex economic, social, and environmental challenges, and at the same time to protect the most vulnerable population and promote local economic and social development, keeping cities' economies booming and growing. To support cities in addressing the climate change effects and, and natural and man-made disasters and consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, the five UN regional economic commissions, the UN Habitat and the UN Capital Development Fund started at the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, a project 
on building urban economic resilience. The project supported efforts of city governments in 16 cities globally to analyze the impact of the pandemic on, on the economies of urban areas, as well as analyze the impact that disaster risks, including climate-induced disaster risks, have on cities. The project further has helped cities in developing their economic recovery and resilience plans, including identifying possible funding sources for economic development, and very importantly, for sustainable infrastructure projects. The project produced a variety of knowledge and capacity building resources, which are being used in the 16 project pilot cities across the world. The project also demonstrated specificities of each region. But generally speaking, we found that many technical tools and approaches can be shared across continents. Uh, and they have been shared in the 16 cities involved. Our global cooperation platform is strong and practical. We learned a lot together, and I would like to share a few thoughts on what we have learned and what could be the topics for working in the future, including topics that are relevant to the discussions at the COP27. First, there is a, a critical need for a cross-sectoral whole-of-government approach. And this is especially true when city governments start realizing they need a whole of government approach to tackling climate change. Second, governments at the both national and city level have to work hand in hand with the private sector. Business engagement, including boosting startup ecosystems for innovation that helps cities overcome very complex challenges is critical, is missing, and we can support it through practical means. Finally, cities need specific capacity boost to attract financing. And I'd like to use the opportunity of the side event to note that it is especially important to get cities eligible and able to, to access climate finance as they build their resilience on the adaptation side, and as they work hand in hand with major industry players and national governments on the mitigation efforts. Let me conclude by saying that I believe that this event, that through its rich discussion, will allow us to further learn from each other. And from the UNSC point of view, we're looking forward to working together to support cities to become climate neutral, resilient, smart, and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Irfan Ali, who is the UN Habitat Regional Representative for the Arab staff for the Arab states. Mr. Ali, you have the floor. Thanks, Diogo. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, the, the movie said it all <laughs> about both projects. Uh, so, uh, but I should say that uh, UN Habitat is very happy uh, to work with our colleagues from the commissions on both projects, the, the enhanced, to enhance the economic resilience in post-COVID of cities and cities, and the, the second project to support or to strengthen the local and national governments and local governments' capacity to adapt and to implement the new urban agenda. So to, uh, this project, the second project uh, the, on the new urban agenda has been running now since, to, since January 2020. And it specifically supports the strengthening of capacities for integrated or multi-sector urban planning and policies and promoting urban recovery, climate resilience, and smart sustainable urban development. This project, as mentioned, is jointly designed and implemented uh, by UN Habitat and the five uh, uh, commissions, the social and economic uh, commissions. And the main principle or the, 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 the principal approach of this uh, project incorporates the strategic frameworks such as the urban policies, uh, vertically integrated urban governance mechanisms, urban and territorial planning and design, and effective municipal uh, uh, financing frameworks as articulated within the new urban agenda, 
um, um, as the means for accelerated implementation of the Agenda 2030 or the uh, SDGs. As you might know, the, the, the new urban agenda lays out, uh, lays out a, a framework for integrating equity and sustainability into inter, um, inter international development. In this context of implementation, I should say that working with cities and local authorities and, and other national authorities within this global program have, have again convinced us that an effective use of data is one of the most important means of implementation of the new urban agenda and the local climate action. Data collection is especially powerful uh, when it is tailored to local contexts and form the foundation, it forms the foundation of evidence-based decision making that leads the, to positive change in urban policy at the local level. As part of this uh, development account project, the Tranche uh, um, 12, uh, there were nine pilot, nine pilot cities and five regions have worked to implement the new urban agenda in more effective manner uh, using integrated, contextually tailored policies and plans. Strengthening, strengthening the capacities of cities in data monitoring and reporting has been done primarily through the use of two tools uh, for, localize, for the localization of SDGs. First, the Urban Monitoring Framework, or the UMF, and second, the Voluntary Local Reviews, the VLRs, both designed with U by UN Habitat or through UN Habitat's leadership in collaboration with the five regional commissions also with substantive support from our colleagues in the United Cities and local government, UCLG, who uh, was also close collaborator on, this, uh, on the guidance for the delivery or the development of the VLRs or the voluntary local reviews. In this event, we wish to highlight and discuss more, ex more experiences from project partner cities uh, such as Agadir in Morocco, who have strengthened their data monitoring and reporting capacities through the use of these two uh, guidance tools. Uh, I should also say that just a few weeks ago, we have uh, uh, launched the, the first voluntary local review in our region for the city of Amman, and today, today we are very excited to hear also the experience from our colleagues in Agadir. And thank you so much for listening to us. Thanks, Sir Fan. Uh, now we turn to the interventions of national and local levels. <coughs> Sorry. I, will ask, I would ask the participants to reflect around two questions. Which are the key elements that the design and implementation of response and recovery local plans to shocks, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, should incorporate? And also, what are the most important obstacles and opportunities to implement these resilience strategies for local governments. Uh, first, I would like to invite Mrs. Sharon Dijma. She is the mayor of Utrecht, Netherlands. Ms. Dijma, please, your reflections. Yes. Is it working? Yes, it is. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Sharon Dijksma. I'm the mayor of uh, the city of Utrecht, as was mentioned. Utrecht is the fourth largest city in the Netherlands, we have uh, about 360,000 inhabitants. That for some of you may not look very big, but actually in the Netherlands it is. And uh, I'm not only here as a mayor, uh, but also as a special envoy on behalf of the city network within the UNFCCC, uh, ECLI and LGMA. Uh, because we really want to uh, advocate for the role of cities within COP and also uh, we would like to see more expertise, more funding um, uh, for the cities um, and uh, to give them a real voice, a formal position at the place where the negotiations take place at the moment and maybe also in future COP. As into your question, uh, I think that we are living and many of us face this uh, I think on a daily basis in what we would call a multi-crisis 
situation. Uh, for instance, in Europe, we are not only dealing with the, uh, the remains, I would say, of, of, of COVID. We are not sure how uh, the um, infection will evaluate uh, further on. But we also face at this moment uh, very high energy costs because of the war in Ukraine and the Russian invasion there. And the prices of energy uh, rise sky high in uh, our countries. And the most vulnerable citizens pay the biggest price for this. So this is asking for action, not only on the national level to cap, for instance, energy costs for uh, vulnerable citizens, but it also asks from us not to stop with the climate agenda, but actually to use this fact of multi-crisis as a kind of accelerator to do things that are necessary. And I would like to give you one example. During uh, COVID, uh, many of us were not able uh, to, to, to meet together. Uh, and if we wanted to have some space, we needed to take public space like the parks, uh, the, the, the areas where there still was nature to maybe walk around and, and find some, some green surroundings uh, uh, with us. And especially in a densely populated country as the Netherlands, we immediately felt how important this public space, this public area is and how necessary it is for our own health and our mental welfare that it is green. So building back with nature is not only something you do because it's necessary for the adaptation agenda on the climate policy, but you can also use it, for instance, as an, a part of the answer on how to, to help people uh, find their way when a pandemic, and there will be new pandemics, I'm sure of it actually, when they will at, again hit uh, uh, the world. So, so this is an, a concrete example on how, for instance, we have been acting. So th we decided as a city of Utrecht that our adaptation agenda has to include uh, planting a lot of extra trees, building new parks, and if we grow, and we do, we are the fastest growing city in the Netherlands, that we need to implement at the same time not only building the houses, but for also, for instance, also building enough schools, building enough theaters, building enough parks, sport fields, etc. And we developed a certain barcode uh, in order to make a, like a, an, an integrated approach. So many houses mean at the same time so many space for sport, uh, schools, etc. So this is how we. Uh, gave an answer uh, actually on, on all the crises at the same time. And last thing that we do, uh, we have a, a fair and just and very social agenda for the most vulnerable people in our city. So it means that for instance now, at this moment, we try to take off um, people from fossil fuels with their housing. We do this with the houses, with the social m rent houses of the corporations of those people who earn the less money and are uh, the most um, um, uh, attacked also and under attack by the big energy prices. And we try to give them a zero net house, isolated, so they have lower cost per month and it's also good for the environment. So these are some examples how we at uh, Utrecht City uh, are working our way through all this misery. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> Planning and management of city, and you have referred to both uh, of these issues, and I would like to come back about public spaces and the requirement of public land that it involves. But now I would like to invite Mr. Lautaro Lorenzo, who is the head of sustainable development at, Est at Esteban Echeverria Local Government, and also at the Executive Secretariat of Merco Ciudades. Lautaro, please, you have the floor. Hi, Diego. Uh, I feel grateful. Uh, I, I'd like to thanks to UNHCC COP27 to this space and Sepa Iclac for this, this space to, to give our opinion. I am from a Mercosur network. This network has 360, 316 cities members and, and uh, this is a permanent and direct dialogue between mayors of Latin America 
we arrange uh, 10 countries. This is present in Uruguay, Brazil, Chile, Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru. And in these cities of the members of the network live more than 120 million persons. And Mercosur is a Latin American chapter of UCG that is, is very concurrent and ap applicable or opinion here because the um, COVID-19 pandemic was on a very challenging, uh, problematic, that local governments have to, uh, have, have, to, have, to, have to try to, to in time to resolve. And one of the big, big problems are at first resource, the, um, we, we can leave apart that the resource, the, the budget planification to adaptation, to climatic adaptation, are, uh, are only 25% of all the, the Paris Agreement budget, the, the total Paris Agreement. Uh, Latin America has 18% of the global population and produce only 18% of the um, emissions. But this, uh, this is, this is the, the counterpart is have a very great problems with climate change consequences. Flooding, drys, uh, and other problems that uh, sobrecharging all the infrastructures, and this, uh, this this kind of situations have more budget related with adaptation. This is a principal challenge that need the that, that need the Latin American cities to um, to, to to be assist in more budget. And the other the other question that I want. I, but I'd like to, to go over the table, uh, is the coordination. It's very necessary in a global and a national and a statutory coordination to implement any actions related to combat climate change and related to, um, to, to, to crises like COVID-19 COVID, COVID health crisis. Thanks, Lautaro. I think that you highlight the issue, very important issue of the emissions, particularly in the most urbanized region of the world, which is Latin America, and the contribution to, to emissions and also the responsibilities and the actions that we can, that we can adopt. Um, I would like now to, to invite to Mr. Jamal Aziz. He's the president of Budget, Finance, and Program Committee of the Agadir Municipal Council, Morocco. Please, Mr. Aziz, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for me to be here to address you and share with you some of the experiences of the municipality of the city of Agadir. Concerning our effort of the activities and actions taken by our city, please allow me to convey the warmest greetings our Mayor, His Excellency Mr. Aziz Akhnouch, the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Morocco, and his pledge to spare no effort or resource to implement the goals of this vital project for a sustainable urban development. The efforts and assistance of several persons should be underlined and appreciated, namely Mr. Bouazza of the Moroccan delegation UN Habitat and Mrs. Leila Ubali, engineer of the municipality and Madame Hanan, the High Commission of Planning. Also, Dr. Sukaina of Iskua for assistance and guidance. And also all the team of their engagement. The encouragement of all these individuals were invaluable in executing the salient ideas of this project. I will start about initiatives, what we did, uh, and policy reactions uh, within COVID-19 in Morocco. First of all, we uh, concerning borders, Morocco has extended the closure of 
its airspace until May 31. Trains and buses within and between cities have been suspended. Uh, secondly, monetary policy on 29 March, the Central Bank of Morocco announced a series of monetary measures to access to credit for businesses and households by enhancing banks, refinancing capacity with the Central Bank. Support very small enterprises. Concerning fiscal policy, special fund to manage the pandemic, 3 billion USD, support to workers and social assistance, support the workers in the informal sectors, all the payment of all social taxes is suspended until 30 June. A learning platform to ensure continuity in teaching. The Moroccan Association of Capital Investors launched an initiative for business support. Agadir Urban Sustainable Development. The city of Agadir faces great challenges, namely inadequate infrastructure, zonal inequalities, water stress, weak power, and energy distribution, waste management and ecological footprint. In front of uh, these challenges, the municipality followed a smart, sustainable approach in its urban development plans to tackle these challenges with a budget of $600 million. The city actions of the municipality prioritize the rehabilitation and the upgrading of the neglected, neglected zone, including the sub suburban towns. The municipality has launched few major projects aimed at the improvement of the quality of life especially concerning the mobility in light of the goals of the new urban agenda. Agadir is undergoing a transformation of its infrastructure and its green space environment. Today, the city is a big workshop. These activities and the city's urban policy offer great opportunities for investment in tourism, agriculture, transformation, industry, education and health facilities necessary for a sustainable, healthy urban development. We are committed to work harder in a spirit of cooperation and open arms for new partnership in the framework of the policy guidelines of His King, His Majesty King M6. Mohammed VI. So now I will start to talk about the experience of voluntary local report. We launched the official launch of the report is December 2021. We started in December 2021 with UN Habitat and uh, ESCOA. We choose seven uh, SDGs. Gender equality, clean water and sanitation, climate action, partnership for, for the goals, and SDG 7 and 11 and 8. The successes of the project. So we had commitment of the city of Agadir in the process of sustainable development in regional, national, and international programs and plan for the period 2023-2024 with the VLR by ensuring better strategic planning. And also we meet uh, multi-stakeholders, we coordinate with them, uh, public and private institution and civil society, raising awareness about localization of SDGs. The main challenge, institutional mechanism de uh, deployed to ensure the implementation of the SDGs at the local level and also the coherence of national and local policies and lack of avail availability of data. Lack of data is the main challenges. Standardization of methodology and reporting pr process between different stakeholders if there is quantitative and qualitative approach or both of them. So 
the essential role of the, the concentrated services in the process of feeding the data is organization of awareness raising and identification of data sources, designation of local point for all project partners, the importance of capacity building in the following areas. Standardization of data, production and exploitation standards at the regional and local level. Also collecting and using statistical data and writing and reporting techniques, regional planning and analysis and evaluation of sectoral strategies at the local and regional level. To conclude my presentation, uh, I would like uh, uh, I would like to thank all those individuals, the UN and the government of Egypt who organized this historic international manifestation of hope for a healthy planet, Earth, and its inhabitants. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jamal. I think that you highlighted a very important issue, the need of relating local to national and global efforts, or the other way around global to national and local. And I think that the BLR process uh, provides that opportunity. Uh, and thinking about the different uh, skills, I would like now to refer to the national level. And I would like to invite Mrs. Norlisa Hashim, who is the CEO of Urbanize Malaysia, to reflect about the main challenges and opportunities to develop integrated and coherent urban policies in the implementation and monitoring on, of the 2030 Agenda and the new urban agenda. How do these policies contribute to reducing inequalities and promoting climate action? A very easy question, Maurice. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Diego. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Norliza, the CEO of Urbanist Malaysia. Uh, Urbanist is actually the center of excellence. Uh, we look into sustainable cities and community well-being. And we are under the Ministry of Housing and Local Government in Malaysia. Uh, probably just before I answer your question, I just want to reflect about, because I think it's very relatable to policies and how integrated policies over the years have actually uh, affected how you know, the issues that we might be facing uh, today. Uh, because Malaysia is actually a very uh, mid-sized nation, I would say, uh, in Southeast Asia. And we became an urban nation in 1991. Uh, but today, because of our very rapid growth uh, policies uh, since after independence, and which has accelerated since 1970, uh, we are now almost 77% uh, people living in urban areas. So that's like 25 million Malaysians living in urban areas. This is because of our very high industrialization policies in the past. And of course, uh, we have moved on since then. We are now very much focused on services and uh, very much also in looking into uh, new economies and green economies. But uh, over the last years, 30 years especially, we have very focused on building affordable homes building infrastructure to support the demand of a new population. And because of that, we also develop policies and development blueprints uh, uh, to address some of the challenges, especially uh, environment, social, and economic challenges that we face. So um, uh, as uh, one of the key most uh, important policy, I would say, is our national urbanization policy. Uh, we've actually uh, reviewed it for the second time, so the latest document is in 2019. And uh, this also reflects upon our five-year economic blueprint, which is uh, talking about how uh, to address the socio-economic disparities and also addressing some of the spatial uh, growth uh, imbalance in terms of spatial growth that we still experience in some parts of the country. So through a mixed economic system, which uh, includes the participation of private sectors you know, and government as a facilitator, uh, Malaysia have actually developed many uh, kinds of policies to address this dynamic growth. At the same time, uh, we are also wary about uh, the climate challenge that we are facing. And because of that, we have national policies on climate change 
and as well as develop national green technology policies because we are committed to reducing uh, or to cut down our carbon intensity against GDP by 45% by 2030 and also to become a carbon neutral nation as early as 2050. Uh, but of course, as every part of the other world, we are also challenged by COVID and the climate crisis, uh, which has set back a lot of our SDGs progress as well. It has digressed quite a bit. And even if we are now recovering in terms of our GDP growth, we still have unemployment, which has improved slightly uh, over the last uh, one year. Uh, we had a very bad flood in December 2021. It displaced almost 71,000 people, affected about 125,000 people, costing property damage of about 4 billion reportedly. And I guess uh, these are impacting the country as a whole, you know. And I think uh, the discussion today about how cities not only should be sustainable but also must be very resilient is very important. So one of the work tracks that we do now is looking at how to strengthen the city itself. And we've actually started a program called the Malaysia SDG Cities. And this program is to encourage all our local governments in Malaysia, which we have about 155, to start a roadmap uh, as to how they can achieve the sustainable development goals, which at the same time adopt uh, and try to uh, reduce their carbon emission and in cities. So the focus is how do we have an inclusive growth and have equitable opportunities, how to have sustainable urban development and livability, and thirdly, of course, to achieve environmental sustainability and local climate action. So uh, we hope through this program, of course, you know, for cities to adopt smarter as well as, you know, uh, low carbon emission solutions. However, uh, I think uh, the challenges, as you mentioned uh, and you asked the question, I think the dynamics of our growth pattern is one of the challenges that we face, you know, because urbanization pattern have actually changed a lot, uh, especially in our larger cities. We are seeing larger cities having declined population. We are also seeing migration happening between city to city and no longer urban, uh, rural to urban. We are also seeing a change on demographic and social profile where we are going into aging community. We are at 7% now and due to be about 14% in 2040. And urban poverty is an issue that needs to be addressed uh, uh, almost immediately because cost of living in cities are becoming very, very high. I, I know that some of these issues probably are you know, similar to any parts of the world, but I think what's important is that when we have this kind of issues, we need to relook at how are we planning and whether or not the policies we have are sufficient or not. So um, gender and equalities, uh, inequalities as issues that we are also facing and you know, addressing them in a holistic manner and gender mainstreaming in our policies as something that is still uh, very much uh, an issue uh, uh, at the local level. So I think one of the major issues that we face is that how do we have access to local data, uh, local information, especially at the city level. Though uh, we have uh, our Department of Statistics, uh, we have started this aggregation of data However, we need local disaggregated data so that our, avid, our planning as well as our decision making can be more evidence-based. In our SDG uh, program, uh, out of the 248 indicators, in 2021, we, can, we only have 59% ready indica uh, indicators. And in 2022, we only have about 65% ready indicators. So, um, I hope that by the time you know, we finish the 2030, we are able to actually have all these indicators, uh, at, especially at the local level. So urban planning, of course, uh, as mentioned by Irfan, you know, that's very important to us. We've, uh, we have a very complete urban planning system in the country where we have urban development plan system. But with so much issues on the ground, now we are talking about community-led planning. You know, how do we 
be you know be more aware of the things that's happening on the ground and to have a more bottom up approach so that it can be more inclusive and meets the real needs uh, and issues because from our SDG cities program that we have undertaken we do see a mismatch between policy strategies and the real needs on the ground and so i think uh, this is where uh, uh, localization of the SDGs needs to take a different dimension altogether and of course uh, one other probably two other issues that uh, is very important is also financing how do we finance uh, a lot of the local programs uh, because I think a lot of the financing mechanism that's available they actually allow for larger scale projects whereas community uh, sustainable projects community resilient projects are not necessarily big money you know but they need uh, a lot of uh, help and a lot of fun to actually make sure that uh, these projects can be scaled up or scaled out and of course i do agree the discussion that has been going on on governance um, and because in malaysia uh, uh, we are not autonomous our local government and out of the uh, uh, targets for the SDGs, our local government can only actually undertake 60% of all the targets due to the, the, the ability, the, uh, the laws that have been empowered onto them. So this is where I think, um, of course, uh, the way we look at it, how we are approaching it, is that how do we bring in partnership, collaboration, and shared responsibility into the process. And that's where I think uh, having a different approach to uh, policy making, it should not just be integrated, but it should be locally integrated and very actionable kind of policies. And I think uh, this is where uh, the, the vertical and horizontal integration uh, is definitely not only necessary, but also how do we ensure that we bring all the urban actors together to fulfill that uh, coherence uh, in order for the policies to be more successful in terms of its implementation. Yeah. It was fantastic, Norisa. Thanks a lot because you display uh, or you presented basically the whole idea of integrated urban policy, that it goes beyond uh, those physical or special interventions but incorporates economic, social, local dimensions and I very much like uh, your uh, that, that you highlighted the gender the gender uh, uh, approach that is required in all these projects and also the need of integration from the vertical I mean both vertical and horizontal levels and I would like now to 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 go for a second round of interventions short uh, interventions in terms of making some questions and of course, invite the, the panelists to, to react, including you, Irfan, as well, to react to, to what has been said. And I would like to start with you, Sharon, in terms of something that Norlisa mentioned, is the distance between policies and implementation. And also, you, you mentioned that it's very difficult for a local government to face both the emergencies, for example, the increase, well, of course, it's not, it's not a, a, a locally originated problem, but increase in energy cost, but also the need of urban planning, of creating urban spaces, of providing housing, particularly in terms of high inflation and so on. So how do you think that a local government should contribute, should uh, approach to these problems? The distance between those requirements, those needs from the population, and also the challenge of implementation. Please, you have the floor. Yes, um, well, that, that obviously is a big challenge because if you look at the Paris Agreement, I was one of those ministers for the environment negotiating on it. Uh, and if you look where we're standing now, we're nowhere near yet the goal. And I, I think that, that cities need to step up because uh, the, yeah, the core of the pollution takes place with our, in our boundaries and at the same time uh, many people are affected by this. So uh, what we try to do actually is to integrate the climate policy, both mitigation and adaptation within our normal policy, so to say. So if we rebuild a road, 
then we try to make it more attractive for bikes and less attractive for cars. Then we try to have more green so that the flooding, for instance, when it takes place, heavy raining, can find its path actually within the city. So if you have a lot of uh, stones in your city, a lot of streets and asphalt, then you know for sure that adaptation is not going to work. So if you reorganize your city, you should bring in, uh, as a kind of holistic approach, everything in the same time. And one of the, the most interesting projects that we have been doing in the last uh, years, and I'm telling you now because I just got a message that uh, we won with this uh, uh, transformation of our public space, uh, at the European Prize for Best Public Space 2022. So this is really nice. And now, wh which did we won and why did we won? Uh, there used to be a four-way um, uh, high road, a motorway, through the heart of the city of Utrecht. And in the old days, uh, before the Second World War, that was a canal, actually. And we, after a referendum on our, our citizens, um, had to build back the canal and take out the highway. And mind you, our citizens were asking for this. And now we have this five kilometer round canal where you could sup, where you can lay down in the sun on the shore, where you can relax and, and, and recreate. And it's actually a green lung in the heart of the city of Utrecht, where it used to be a road, and not a tiny road. Like, uh, like uh, you, you could 100 kilometers doing on this road, right? So it's, it's not a surprise for me that we won this European prize with it, but it is a, 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 an example on how to implement. But it is not easy. I mean, in many cities, probably people are not that uh, progressive or so much in the fast forward that they understand actually that such a trans transformation is beneficial for them. So what we need to do, for instance, yesterday I was at the WHO discussion, and we need also to put health as a marker much more in the discussion. We all know that, that children with asthma uh, are much more ill, they die earlier when they live near uh, the roads and there is heavy uh, uh, traffic uh, right underneath their apartment, for instance. So if, if we do not take the responsibility of bringing down this traffic and try to have better public transport, try to uh, encourage people, uh, to tempt people, seduce them actually, to take the bike or to walk, then, then this air pollution will not vanish. It will not go away by itself. So we really need to push the limit uh, with policy. And uh, I think that their policy and, and implementation go hand in hand. And what you do need to do is to take your uh, citizens on board, show them what the benefits are, and explain also why you want this transformation and that it's not a threat, but actually something which is uh, healthier for everybody. So we, we bring in the health uh, discussion in the heart of the climate policy because that is the only way that I can uh, convince people to really change uh, not only policy, but also their personal behavior. And, and this is uh, what I think is very uh, important. Um, we need almost uh, psychologists to, to, to help us out. In what way do we connect with citizens the best in order to get public support for the uh, climate policy agenda where in which we need that it has to be done and and yeah and you need also the government to support it but even when they don't look at the US where when Trump was leading uh, the country he pulled the, uh, the the country out of the Paris agreement but the cities remained and and states as California remained so they proceeded and therefore I think it's so important that we uh, have a lot more uh, um, yeah, uh, power also within this discussion and within the uh, negotiations because I really think that uh, that is at this time necessary. If mayors rule the world, 
you know that's yeah, the that's a that's good the, book that's a, yeah. that's a wonderful book yeah and it's a and good I, frame I, I, I and actually they already do but <laughs> we're not recognized for it yet true well congratulations for the for the prize congratulations for the for the word and i think that when you're referring to public space as well you're referring to mental health and even you know in terms of transportation what's the situation of the people how are they going to behave when they have to spend two hours in very bad conditions in public transportation like we we like to see public space as an expression of right to the city which is also uh, something important we turn to latin america lautaro you mentioned the need of coordination and i think the coordination between local level and national level in latin america it's a still a challenge. For sure that it's not the only region in the world that, that that's happening, but I, I will say that in Latin America it's particularly an issue, besides many, many historical reasons, political and so on. How do we improve that? How do, how, what do we do to make, that, to make that happen? Thank you, Diego. This is a um, very good question, and um, how I explain. I have we have in uh, Extrema Echeverria two, two interesting experiences that can illustrate the one way on methodology to, to work that. At first, in the 10 years ago, our local government have uh, uh, only 20% of population have uh, sewer system coverture and fresh water coverture. In 10 years now, we are with radios near to 80, 85% of cover to the sewer system and fresh, fresh water to all, to, all, to all the population. This was a um, very titanic work and taking the, some of the virtues that might uh, that say the, the other mayor, uh, some of the virtues that have to, to give, have to, 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 to retain a mayor is construct Constructs codes, codes, codes. Explain to people how some actions that don't have an, a direct beneficiary or result we uh, per, per, be permanent or, 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 or can give an uh, outcome on the future. Because in Latin America, we are constructing the, the cities in a strange way because at first, we have the urbanization, we have uh, the housing, and after uh, we have the, the construction of the sewer system and the service. Uh, this, is the, um, this is reality of the developed countries and the developed country cities, and with another complex more, the peripheral, uh, the, the peripheral uh, developed cities in developed countries. That, uh, th there is the, uh, an, an internal inequality between capital or central city and metropolitan cities. And, and, and it is recurrent in all Latin America and in, in my city. Uh, the, the way to, to trade this, the, this, this very um, encouraging challenge is uh, to the, the role of the mayors or the role of the political authorities to coordinate. Coordinate within the different uh, enterprises and the different uh, institutions or um, or government areas to, to coordinate the, the budgets and implementations of the services and implementations of, 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 the, of the works. Uh, and there is, there is an important role of the local government and the political authority and at local level. And in, in the other hand, another experience is the river basin of Riachuelo. Riachuelo Matanza is the most contaminated uh, river basin in Argentina. And there have uh, three, uh, one national authority, two, uh, go, two, statue, two statue level uh, authorities, City of Buenos Aires and Province of Buenos Aires, and 14 local government. There is the, um, the, the most important experience in sanitation. And it's very, very important to make institutional um, tools to, to coordinate actions. In example, that one local government finish an asphalt when the other local government uh, 
finish the, the same asphalt in, 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 his, um, in his boundaries. Or where you must to, to make a relocalization of people on, the, on a creek or in, a, in, in the coastal of, uh, in, the Kupi, in, the, in the Kupi coastal of the river basin, it's very important to coordinate with uh, social society, uh, with the inhabitants, with uh, local authorities uh, related with housing, with financing or organizations to, to not, not only to, to make in, in form and time the housing, uh, it, it, is, it is to coordinate that the um, resource to the relocalization and the explanations to all the populations will be, uh, will be, be able to, to make this with uh, respect of human rights to, to make the localization and to to make in in in, in the in the in, in the perfect form to the to the population. Uh, this is a, a, a very very hard efforts of coordination, and even if you have the resource, it's important to create and to practice uh, tools related with dialogue related with participation of social society, with participation of local government, with the participation of uh, national and statu, 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 um, statual level. And this is a very challenge and it's a practice that, that makes it all the days. Thanks, Lactaro. Uh, first, we construct and then we create the city. Informality is one of the key features of the Latin American city. Uh, well, I, I know that uh, Mayor Dajma has some other commitments, but thank you very much, Sharon, to, 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 be, to be with us. And we would like to continue now inviting uh, Mr. Ali to some comments on what has been said and uh, about this exchange. Please. Very, very, very Thank briefly, you. because also I should uh, uh, leave to another session. So um, I just, uh, just would like to say that, in, in my opinion, the only way to uh, reverse the current trend and to back, uh, uh, to, to track for the SDGs is uh, to localize the SDGs. I cannot emphasize more on the importance, uh, um, uh, the important role of cities as uh, colleagues as the, the distinguished uh, panelists emphasized or highlighted now, we are living in an extremely um, uh, and rapidly urbanizing world we, with more than 50, 55% of the po global population that's expected to increase to almost 70% by 2050. The second point that I want to emphasize uh, in order to fill the gap that you referred to, the gap between policies and uh, implementation, we need two things, in my opinion. Uh, we need financing, and you also emphasize on this, and we need partnerships. We need partnerships involving government, local government, academia, uh, international community, civil society as well, uh, local communities, they, were, they need all to be involved, join efforts for the localization, for, to, for the localization of the SDGs and uh, implementation, to move towards implementation. For this particular reason, I would like to highlight that tomorrow, tomorrow the presidency of COP will launch the, the global initiative on sustainable sustainable urbanization for uh, sustainable urbanization and resilience for the next generations surge and tomorrow there will be the first ever the first ministerial meeting for urban or for sus sustainable urbanization and housing convened for the first time in cop and we hope that these efforts will continue to bring uh, all efforts to mobilize all efforts, all possible partnerships for the uh, uh, for the implement for the localization of the SDGs and to support further the implementation uh, to move from policy level towards implementation to advance the SDGs to advance the local urban agenda and the local climate action. So this is what I wanted to share and thank you uh, again for giving me this opportunity to speak to you while I'm not a panelist. Thank you. Thanks, Irfan. Uh, financing and partnership. 
and financing regarding sustainable urban development and climate action, I, I think it's key. So I, I'm sure that for my colleagues at ECLAC, that's, those are music to their ears. Uh, I would like to ask Jamal now to make some reflections be because you refer to a voluntary local review to the construction of vision, but also mm, the challenge of increasing capacities, capacity building. How, how do we do that? Because both are probably sides of the same coin. Uh, you, in, in order to have a, a well-prepared vision, well-defined vision, you need as well the involvement of many stakeholders, but you need um, the local capacities to, to, to go ahead. And thanks, Irfan, to, to be with us. Thank you, Diego. So, uh, concerning uh, capacities, we have program to reinforce capacities. We work uh, with UN Habitat in preparation and ISCUA to prepare uh, VLR, and we talk about reinforce the capacities, and we work on that with the external services. Uh, it's very hard uh, in local area uh, to develop uh, capacities for especially f in, in public sector but in private we have uh, many opportunities to do that because we have financing and we have a lot of partnership but in public sector and admini public administrations still uh, we, we are fighting uh, to find uh, a f financing and uh, to let uh, uh, participants uh, enhance this, uh, their level uh, to achieve every program that we can work with the international or, uh, organi organization or even uh, at national level. So as um, uh, Mr. Ali said that uh, finance, we should, policies need financing, partnership, also civil society. Here to reinforce the capacity I think capacities need also the implication and adaptation for civil society. So we should work with association and let them uh, uh, give us an added value uh, because civil society has a lot of rules when w uh, the politicians and stakeholders uh, share with them the decision and the vision, it will be really it will ha it will have uh, an excellent result thank you thanks jamal i think that the involvement of civil society is key in that process the whole idea that the public sphere it does not belong only to the, to the state to the national local states but also to, to all of us um Nordisa, uh, you mentioned resilience urban resilience you referred to some flaws some shocks, natural uh, disasters. Well, well, those natural disasters, that's not, that, that it's not the case, it's human-made disasters. Uh, but also there are economic shocks. And the whole idea of urban resilience is to be prepared uh, to both two issues, not only to the physical, the spatial uh, impacts, but also to the economic, social, well, pan the pandemic has been an example of that. And then it comes to the whole idea of preparing, you mentioned the preparation of the cities, the design of plans at the local level, national plans as well, implementation. But finally, that requires financing. And I think that Erfan made, made a good point in terms that we, we might have covered some very important issues, but at the end of the day, it's a matter of local capacities, vision, yes, and financing. How do we square that circle? Well, um, how do we really close that circle? First of all, um, I'm not sure in, in other parts of the world where, you know, how, what is the strength of a municipal in terms of finance? Uh, but uh, in, in Malaysia, you know, uh, we don't have a specific budgets against disasters, for example, you know? It's not that you put in in your budget to say that uh, X amount or a certain percent is, you know, to address um, disasters. I think it's only in the last years since we've been having it, then some form of allocation is being done. But a lot of it actually comes from either central 
or state governments or, or regional governments which you, you refer to. So I think this is where uh, when we talk about funding, uh, when, when, when you are already in a situation of the disasters, you get a lot of help. You know, people are giving you funds, you know, so it's easy during that time. But I think the more difficult part is rebuilding, rebuilding it and also, you know, having the funds to rebuild it or having the funds to actually for adaptation and mitigation. You know? I think that's where um, cities need more fun in terms of uh, adaptation fund and local actions towards adaptation probably is a, is a plan that we need to be more prepared with. You know, we need to incorporate that in terms of our development blueprints as well. Uh, because I think moving forward, uh, planning is not only something that we can preempt, but something that is also considering the inevitable that might happen. And I think this is where being more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more prepared, uh, more providing the right allocation, I think is still needed. You know? Uh, but one of the things that we all learn uh, a lot in, in Malaysia is uh, the pandemic has and, and, the, and the floods has actually brought people together, the power of the community itself. And we, we never uh, understood how powerful it was, you know, and until we saw that how communities actually came together, they were the ones who were helping each other and providing the right resources to support each other. And I think that kind of community collaboration, uh, you know, resiliency is something more powerful than anything else. You know, so if we can formalize some of this informal system, you know, I think that would be really great. You know, uh, bring the this uh, community-based initiatives, community efforts in terms of how they are working together, not only with funding public transport, funding even capacity building to assist maybe uh, women to have different jobs because they were laid off during the COVID, you know. I think there was that, that element of people helping people, you know. We have a saying in Malaysia, kita jaga kita, you know. We take care of each other. I think that's so powerful than anything else. So how can we formalize an informal system would be really great, you know. I don't really have a perfect answer, but probably <laughs> something to think about, yeah. A lot to think about. Uh, no, and I, I very much like your approach. Uh, social resilience, at yeah. the end of the day, is uh, social capital, we'll say some, some, some people probably know the best, the best of, the, of the terms, and avoiding that top-down approach that many times we have been, uh, we have been doing. Um, so great, no, thanks a lot, Nerlisa, great, great reflections. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, all, all of you. I would like now to, to, to give the floor to Sukaina Alnas Rawi. She will be joining us virtually. She is the Urban Development Lead of ESWA for some final remarks. Sukaina, if you are there, please go ahead. There you are. Hello, Diego. Hello, everyone. The very first uh, um, very famous statement. Do you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you very well. Perfect, perfect. Uh, first of all, apologies for not being able uh, to be with you in person. It's really uh, my loss. So this distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, really allow me to thank you for all for making uh, this event possible. And I thank you for a very fruitful discussion on the SDGs um, localization and sustainable urban policy for resilience. And I really thank you for sharing your experiences and insights from the different regions of the world. Now, through this discussion, we learned more about um, the key elements that the design and implementation of response and recovery local plans uh, to shocks should incorporate. We've listened to the most important obstacles and opportunities to implement and these resilience strategies for local government. We've learned, uh, some of you um, uh, um, uh, earned the prize and we congratulate you for this. We listen to the main challenges and opportunities to develop integrated and coherent uh, urban policies, facilitating the implementation and the monitoring of the new urban agenda and the 2030 agenda, particularly through the development of voluntary local reviews. 
listening to those insights, I would say to the insights on how policies contribute to reducing inequalities and promoting climate action was also extremely interesting. Indeed, they're very tightly coupled. Now, along these issues, I want to again highlight uh, that ASQA and the four uh, UN Economic Commissions and UN Habitat have been working together as one to support member states and their local authorities in localizing the SDGs and in implementing, uh, in localizing the SDGs and in the implementation of the new urban agenda and its transformative commitments. Of course, the, the support aimed at strengthening capacities for urban planning and promoting urban recovery, climate resilience, and smart, sustainable urban development. Together as one, we've implemented the projects that were mentioned at the start, uh, mainly focused on the cooperation for the implementation of the new urban agenda and building urban economic resilience. And all of you distinguished panelists have been mentioning uh, uh, this concept. These projects mainly aimed at incorporating the strategic frameworks such as urban policies, vertically integrated urban governance mechanisms, um, urban and territorial planning and design, which are all considered to be key for climate change adaptation and mitigation. And they're very well articulated in the new urban agenda as the means for accelerating the implementation also of the SDGs. So keeping all this in mind and keeping in mind that no urban resilience is possibly achieved without climate action at the center, the, the, these projects led to an increased understanding among local and national governments, the private sector, academia, civil society, of the impacts of shocks such as COVID-19 and the strategies and opportunities for urban economic recovery and resilience. Of course, this was achieved through a series of activities. We're not gonna go into the details now. However, data collection was central uh, uh, among these activities. And I, I mentioned this just to note that the availability of reliable and comparable urban data is key for evidence-based decision-making, which leads to achieving sustainable urban development and the ability to anticipate and recover from shocks. That's to start with. The project also led to an expanded participation in the economic resilience building process. It is really a process and it, an expanded participation by relevant local, national stakeholders and partner cities and countries, as well as strengthened capacities and uh, technical capacities for both local and national government, the private sector, the academia, and the civil society to participate in uh, recovery and resilience planning. And we insist on this issue of planning because planning leading to urban resilience integrates climate action it integrates climate action through various means, different aspects, including energy and water supply, which constitute the basis for a resilient infrastructure. The projects also led to an increased capacity regarding the potential sources of finance for partner cities to implement economic recovery and build uh, strategies. Dr. Erfan just said, and he thankfully uh, mentioned and highlighted that, Financial resources and sound investments are needed to address climate change, to both reduce emissions, promote adaptation to the impacts that are already occurring, and to build resilience. So basically the benefits that flow from the, these investments uh, <coughs> dramatically outweigh any upfront costs. From another end, cities lead on climate action through localizing the SDGs and reviewing pro progress achieved. Localizing SDGs is key, and it has been, uh, thank you, distinguished panelists for mentioning this um, often throughout the discussion. The projects also assisted local and national authorities in strengthening the national local development dialogue and increasing policy coherence. I'll just take the Arab region as an example um, since uh, Mr. Laziz mentioned Agadir. So, for example, in the case of the Arab region, the Su pilot Su city... Sukaina, one, one uh, minute, mainly... sorry. What, one minute, sorry. Yes, sure. Amman and Agadir fostered the localization of the SDGs and reviewed progress towards the achievement. These two VLRs in the very first Arab in the Arab region at, addressed SDG 13, among many other goals. Um, 
Efforts should be intensified to support local governments in developing inclusive policies and encourage community engagement. And we should encourage public-private partnership and a whole of a society approach to address the complexities of the socioeconomic and environmental impacts of shock. I'll conclude by saying transformative recovery for us means a shift in the way that cities produce, grow, move, and are planned and managed. It is really necessary uh, to change the urban development pattern and view our cities as a source of social and environmental opportunities for the realization of social and economic um, rights. It is in the cities where action is, is key, and I'll end with uh, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who said in the World Cities Day, let us uh, act local to go global. So today at COP27, I would say let us aim to localize climate action to achieve resilience and ultimately foster sustainable development. And thank you all. Uh, hopefully next time we'll meet all in person uh, in COP28. Over to you, Diego. Thank you, Sukaina, for, for, your for your contributions. And thank you all for participating today. As you, Sukaina, mentioned, we are, well, actually we are in your region. Transformative recovery, urban sustainable development. Cities are key to climate change. With different contexts, regional particularities, there is no universal solution. But cities should be seen as both the source and the solution to many of the challenges that we face. Thank you. Thank you to the people in the room, and thank, thanks to the, uh, to the people who accompanied us. Thank you.